Okay, I think it's uh, time to start. So, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for stopping by. Uh, so, we have a session here, uh, just to make sure you're in the right session, where uh, the session is uh, securing a connected car. So, if we look at what's happened uh, with the, the car over the last few decades, in terms of technology, you see in the 90s, you had uh, electronics, then telematics, more intelligence around um, your fuel economy and uh, how uh, soon you have to refuel. Then you have the infotainment system, which is basically the uh, display you have between uh, the front seats, where you can have a map and you can have all, uh, sound, typically, like music. Um, so that brought a lot of intelligence in it, obviously, and then towards the end of the 2000, around 2010, uh, it became standard that cars were connected uh, to 3D networks uh, and the internet. Uh, right now, there's a lot of focus on assisted driving, uh, developing these type of technologies, so safety features in uh, case you're close to the edge of the road or uh, you're in too close to a car in front of you, uh, or, or uh, things that could, uh, could be dangerous. Um, and then going forward, uh, I'm sure you've also seen a lot of uh, work on autonomous cars, especially from various Silicon Valley companies uh, like Apple and Google, and uh, also Uber is, is doing a lot of work there. Uh, and obviously also all the uh, OEMs or the car manufacturers are working hard on uh, autonomous driving. So obviously there's quite a bit of work until that is safe. So, uh, but uh, when that hits the road, it will be a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, software that will uh, uh, be in the car in order to, to uh, uh, make this work. Uh, so the point, I guess, not surprising, but um, this is more of a proof that there is more and more software that, that ends up in the car. And, um, We'll have a look at some of the implications during the session. Uh, just first, a few words about me. So my name is Einstein Stenberg. Uh, right now, I live in the US, and they typically call me Einstein. And uh, uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, so it's a good, good way to kick things off. And um, I worked uh, in software, in security, and management software for about seven years. I have a background from uh, computer science and cryptography. Right now I work on a, a project called Mender. Uh, so we're developing an over-the-air updater for Linux. Uh, it's open source under Apache 2 license. Um, and yeah, we have a boost upstairs also if you want to find out more. Uh, and there's my email, so oops, it's a bit high volume, okay. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, if you have any feedback on the presentations, I've been giving this a couple of times already and improved it uh, because of feedback. So if it's something you don't like or you like, uh, please let me know so, um, so we can make it better. Uh, so for the rest of the session, this uh, is how it's structured. So uh, we'll first look at, uh, so obviously you see uh, there's more and more software and then why is this happening? What kind of opportunities are the car manufacturers, uh, also known as the OEMs, looking for? Why are they doing it? Uh, we'll look at the, more on the security side next. Uh, we'll look at one specific attack where a car got hacked. Uh, it's a famous story, but um, uh, not a lot of people know the details of what happened, so we'll try to cover at least some of these details. Uh, and then we'll look at uh, more on the patching problem and how, how we can do that, because that's closely tied to the security here. Okay, makes sense? Perfect. Um, so one of the main drivers for having more software in the, in the car is, uh, is obviously that the car manufacturers see that they can uh, make more money that way. That's usually how it goes. Uh, so for example, uh, Tesla is considered <laughs> one of the most innovative car companies. Um, and they have this add-on feature 
that um, you can buy for a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, so, so this specific example is about the autopilot, so that's, uh, that's assisted driving, as we mentioned in the beginning. Um, and uh, they can do that by, by delivering uh, software after the car, uh, car is uh, sold. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of reports there also showing that uh, the, it predicts a lot of new uh, revenue. There's an estimate of 27 billion um, from Navigant here. Uh, but the other side of it is also the cost saving you can achieve. So if you look at the IVI, which, <laughs> yeah, so like in technology you have the same name for several things. So IVI is the infotainment system, so the maps, music system you have in your car. Um, this is typically how the stack looks. So you have hardware, board support, operating system, uh, maybe an OTA updater, uh, some middleware application, and then the HMI on the top. And um, uh, the key thing to take away from here in terms of cost saving is that you can see the, the cost of maintaining the lower layers are very high. So about 60% of the costs come from these lower layers, uh, where the differentiation is actually on the top layers, which might be yeah, around 30% of the cost. So uh, the reason is that when you have, so what the end user or the customer sees is the apps and the interaction with the system. They don't see the drivers underneath. As long as they work, then that will uh, satisfy them. Um, so that's why you are today seeing um, more support on, on having open source in these lower layers. Uh, how many of you have heard about AGL or yeah, a couple of people? Yeah. So there's a. That's one example. Uh, there are several initiatives. Um, so AGL is a automotive grade Linux. So it's basically a Linux distribution that focuses on uh, on automotive and uh, IVI systems in, in particular. So they're trying to build and bring uh, open source into these uh, lower layers of the, of the car, uh, car IVI system. Um, so, which makes a lot of sense to use open source there because you don't have any differentiation here, or at least very little, and, and the cost is uh, quite high if you're going to build all this yourself. Um, yeah, so a bit on OTA updates. Uh, obviously, I, I work a bit in, in this, uh, but uh, the reason I, or the main reason I think this is important is that when you see that all this complexity comes to the car in, in terms of more and more software, then obviously you need uh, more frequent improvements as well, because uh, I don't know, how, how many of you develop software primarily? Okay, majority, okay. So you, uh, you know that you don't release just version 1.0 and there's no bugs, uh, that uh, typically doesn't happen. I, I have a, also developed a, a bit of software, and uh, at least my code is not like that. So uh, typically there is a um, connection between the amount, so like the number of lines of code and the number of bugs. There is some kind of ratio you can you can work out there, depending on the project. Um, so, uh, and also in the connected cars today, uh, you could uh, see that about one, three, uh, one third of the recalls can be um, fixed by just uh, software updates instead of just driving the car back to the manufacturer, which is obviously quite expensive. And in terms of security fixes, it's also very important that the end customer does it, but maybe they don't. So, uh, and yeah, so this can uh, result in quite a bit of savings. Uh, there are some estimates on that, uh, 35 billion. Uh, and then this example will have a look at uh, the fi uh, Fiat Chrysler hack. Uh, happened last uh, summer. Um, so it was a couple of security researchers that managed to hack it, uh, 
how many of you heard about that one, the Fiat Chrysler? Okay, about one third. Um, so uh, I'm not trying to pick on Fiat Chrysler. Uh, there are problems everywhere, but it's just as an example of, of uh, how things can happen and why it happens. So we'll have a look at that. So this uh, is the end result um, of what happened to them. So there were two security researcher, uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, I hope I pronounce it correctly. But um, uh, they presented at Black Hat USA in 2015, uh, and they showed how you could gain full control of the vehicle. Uh, so it was a bit interesting because this uh, the person that you barely can see inside the car, he, uh, he was actually a, a journalist. They wanted to make a story about this because they, they told him, OK, so we managed to hack this car. and. Uh, Okay, so I have to run a story on this. And the way it worked was that he had to sit in the car while they hacked it. Um, so he was kind of screaming while this, this was <laughs> filmed. And uh, he was driving down um, the highway or autobahn. And uh, they could take over the car and, and just like steer it and, uh, um, and apply the brakes. Uh, so it seemed like quite a scary ex experience. Um, so when, when this happened, they also didn't have a way to, to fix it remotely. So they had to recall 1.4 million cars. Um, so yeah, this, this happens today. So admittedly, it's, it wasn't that easy hack. So these guys, I think they spent two years to figure out how to do this. They had to go through several systems. Uh, but it's definitely possible. Uh, and it's probably possible in a lot more cars than just this one. Um, so if you look at what happened in particular, so if you look at that uh, infotainment system or head unit, um, there is a Wi-Fi hotspot in, I guess, several new cars now. And the reason is that they sell as a, as a service on top of, yeah, you purchase the car and then you can subscribe to the service. You get Wi-Fi in your car for about yeah, $40 or 40 euros uh, a month. Um, the reason, so the value proposition there to the customers is that, uh, so you have a lot of annoying kids. I don't have kids myself, but um, I've seen, <laughs> seen, seen that where they can give the kids some Wi-Fi, put them in the back seat, and give them an iPad or uh, whatever ent entertainment unit they want. Um, so that's why they have this, this Wi-Fi in the car, so, so that you can uh, yeah, use your devices there. Uh, and it's password protected, so, uh, so it, seems, uh, it seems pretty safe. But uh, uh, what happened was that the password was very easy to guess because it was based on the provisioning time, uh, which was uh, January 1st, 2013, 000, 000 plus minus one minute. Um, so if you had about 60 or 100 guesses, you could pretty much guess the password in any of these Wi-Fi's. Uh, and then there was a software vulnerability in the uh, in the multimedia or infotainment system. Uh, so once you got in through the Wi-Fi, you could actually get into that uh, um, yeah, display unit that you can see here. Um, so when they did that, <laughs> they could control that, uh, uh, that uh, multimedia system. Uh, so they could uh, control the music. And uh, it did also have a GPS, so you can track the car that way. Obviously, at this stage, it wasn't that interesting because you had to be very close to the car to, uh, to be in the Wi-Fi range. Uh, so probably at this point, it's not like a very serious attack, mostly annoying. You can walk past cars and change their uh, audio output. Um, but what they did next is that they breached the cellular network. So uh, the Sprint cellular network. So uh, 
now, instead of using the Wi-Fi, they use that as the entry point, and uh, they could control the same things, the uh, radio and the GPS coordinates, uh, but now they could do it uh, in, the, in the entire US, basically. So now uh, it became a lot more interesting to have the GPS coordinates because you could actually track a car that way. So the next thing they started to look at was the, what's below that uh, uh, display uh, or, or infotainment system. Um, so at the bottom here, you can, well, I don't think you can see it, but uh, um, there's the engine and, um, and, and brake systems and uh, also like the locks of, uh, of the doors. And they're like very critical, safety critical uh, components that are connected uh, via something called a controller area network. So that's basically these uh, lines that you can see is the, the so-called CAN bus. Um, so it connects about 70 electronic uh, control units. Uh, and then you need uh, a way to see what's going on here because uh, if there's something wrong with your car, your oil, your uh, transmission, um, something is unsafe, then uh, it needs to be reported up to the uh, user so that he, he knows about this and it can be put to, uh, yeah, to uh, maintenance. Uh, so there needs to be like this um, flow information going up from the canvas, but uh, it was designed in such a way that uh, this is read-only uh, through a, a V850 chip, as it's called, uh, which would uh, sit close to the uh, infotainment system. Uh, so this seems fine because uh, obviously the, the interesting thing is if you could have something from the top right, uh, uh, if uh, or tell the canvas or put on the canvas that the brakes should be applied and, and so on. But so now you know that that's exactly what happened. Uh, but uh, the reason was that uh, they updated um, that chip with the malicious firmware update. So so now they could uh, both read and write to, to the canvas. That was controlled by the. Um, the V850 ship that, that this was just a read-only. Um, and uh, that head unit was able to, to update that firmware. So uh, the main takeaway here, security-wise, is that it wasn't uh, checked for authenticity, the firmware, so you could install anything. Um, and that made, made this possible. So this is basically how it all uh, was put together. So you had a cellular breach at the top, uh, which breached the uh, head unit uh, or the in infotainment system through a vulnerability. And then they could put a malicious firmware update on that V850 chip, which would allow them to both read and write to that canvas. And now you have full control of the car. So again, trying to, to see what we can learn from this. Uh, so obviously the Wi-Fi password was quite easy to guess, and uh, easy to guess password is not a new problem, I would say. Uh, but, um, and then you had this uh, service that you could access in the head unit that was vulnerable, not updated, so out of date software uh, or vulnerabilities staying in a system for a long time, also not a new problem, I would say. Uh, then you have the firmware update, didn't have the authenticity checks, and then finally when all these bad things happened, then the only way to fix it was to drive the car physically back. So it all lined up pretty uh, nicely, or <laughs> shouldn't say that, I guess. But um, yeah. Uh, no, so they don't have to be in the car because they used, um, so the cellular network is uh, uh, a 3G network that's connected to the, the infotainment system. 
So they used either the cellular network or in uh, or the Wi-Fi that the car had to get in. This is trivial things. Don't fit a cellular or Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, and then that's it. Problem solved. Yeah, that's one uh, one way to fix it. Don't have network connectivity. Um, but the EU, uh, EU regulations say you have to have a three G modem in your car. Yeah, and you have to have a GPS. And it doesn't matter if you can. Yeah. It's a hazardous. We call we, we call the one. Yeah, has to and be it's hazardous. mandatory from two thousand eighteen. Yeah, it has to be. But you can have a GPS and you have a unique ID. It doesn't have to be connected to anything else. Which is how you need to be connected. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I I don't know the the answer to it, but uh, yeah, that. Do you use normal only your you only need to acknowledge the start. Well, officially, yes, you need to acknowledge the transition. But to have the CAN bus work, only one person needs to acknowledge. In practice, everyone does. If you have multiple things on the bus, you can get away without uh, having one thing acknowledged. Yeah, uh, so also to summarize the discussion a bit here, I think, uh, is that the, the more complexity you have, the larger is the attack surface. Uh, and um, there is one metric, uh, like I mentioned also, that the more software you have, the more bugs you will have. And there is a metric that uh, there's between <coughs> 1 to 25 bugs for every 1,000 lines of code. So. Um, this is a very wide range, obviously, depending on, I guess, who develops it and uh, what kind of system it is and what kind of QA processes you have uh, and regulations, regulation uh, requirements. But uh, the point is that um, uh, it's not possible to have zero <laughs> vulnerabilities in software, and we shouldn't assume that. Uh, we need to assume that there are, uh, there are vulnerabilities and handle it from there. Of course, you should try to reduce the number, but um, they will still be there. Uh, so, so one thing we could do uh, is to rely on, on uh, well-maintained software and, and keep it up to date. Uh, uh, and uh, there's, uh, I'm not sure if you've been involved in these discussions, but uh, there's a lot of discussions about uh, open source versus proprietary, what is the most secure, uh, and so on. But uh, I don't think those discussions are very fruitful. It, it, uh, there are other things that are more important than uh, whether or not it's open source. Uh, and that's more uh, about the maintenance of, of the software itself. Um, so also, if you, don't, if you build less software in-house and, and use more well-maintained uh, well software, then uh, you will probably be in a, in a better spot. So of course, there's quite a few. Um, Examples on, on vulnerabilities that, um, like in the OpenSSL Heartbleed, which is quite famous uh, by now, um, people thought it was very well maintained. So they thought, like, OpenSSL, everybody uses it, half of the internet uses it. Uh, so it has to be well maintained, but it turned out it was like two maintainers doing a part time job on, on that project. So obviously, it's um, much better funded now, and, and there were some big companies that put some money in to fund this project. Uh, but uh, it turned out it wasn't that well maintained after all. Uh, and then there are some security principles that apply uh, 
yeah, pretty widely also in the car case. Uh, so you have the principle of least privilege. Uh, so don't give components or processes more uh, access than, than they need to. Uh, well, in some cases it could be a matter of what user a process runs as, for example. And then you have separation of privilege, so maybe you can split up software in, into two parts. So one is able to access the network and the other maybe the file system and maybe they don't need access to all uh, all at once. Uh, so, so it's more about compartmentalizing uh, the, the system so that if one part is breached, then you don't necessarily have full control of the entire system. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, um, also with virtualization and uh, hypervisors and, and so on. Um, and Kirchhoff's principle, that's uh, related to cryptography, so where um, you should only assume that the keys that you use for uh, encrypting or signing things are secret, but the algorithms are well known by the attacker. So the Bottom line is don't invent your own crypto algorithms and try to be secure that way, but uh, rather use well-known algorithms that, and keep the keys very secret. Uh, yeah, so moving on a bit to the security patching uh, problem. So this is a graph of, uh, uh, this is the probability that uh, vulnerability has an exploit, and this is the number of days after the vulnerability was published. So basically, as you would expect, the longer or the more amount of days that pass, the higher is the probability that somebody exploited the, the vulnerability or made an exploit available. Um, so some numbers you could see is like, uh, after five to 10 days, there's less than 10% probability it's exploited. After 60 days, it's 90%. The problem, I guess you can see as well, is that 110 days is the re uh, average remediation time or average time that the systems get patched. So there's quite a long, long time here in general that, that people have to, to exploit these systems because the Exploits are available and the systems are vulnerable for uh, uh, two months at least in, in, in average. Um, so this is a very wide uh, survey from, from uh, yeah, you have the source down there also you can look at it if you want to. But um, I think also in embedded and in connected cars, as we've seen in the example as well, uh, it looks much worse because they are maybe never uh, remediated. Um, so you could ask why this happens. Uh, and one of the typical things about security is that you don't fix it because you can't see it. So it's not a feature. Uh, and then when it happens, it's too late, unfortunately. So that might be one reason. Uh, could be expensive or, or risky if you want to to update manually, for example, uh, or to integrate uh, the updater might be quite a bit of work, um, depending on how you do these updates. And uh, always with deploying software, there's a risk of, of downtime or or breaking the production environment, which is like the big uh, scare uh, when, when you're doing things like this. Uh, maybe there's polit politics reason, and yeah, if you have systems, you can also think about how, how frequently you patch, patch them, uh, or if you have a way to do it. Um, yeah. Do you have any other reasons why you think it doesn't, uh, why security patching is not happening that frequently in your or other environments, if you rather speak about other environments. Yeah. Well, it depends on how constrained the source of life. Yep. Constrained on bandwidth, on cost of your uh, network connection or energy, battery life, and you really want to spend the uh, updates, try to update as fast as possible because it might be good if you have a couple of months less battery or whatever. Exactly. 
exactly. Yeah. So. To the main, that's all right. Yeah. 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 <coughs> mm. So over the air update is necessary to need it, but this is also a big yeah, barrier. Security yeah. hole. Yeah. yeah, it could be a security hole as well. Yeah. Sometimes it's just hard to make the user install the application. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you never have to let the user make the update. That's <laughs> <laughs> a big problem. Yeah, so they have an incentive. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and uh, as you might, uh, well, you probably know, um, this is a harder problem in, in embedded, like I, I said, and that's one of the reasons it looks a bit worse there, I think. As was mentioned, it's expensive to have physical access, like in a car case, you have to drive it in for uh, for repair, maybe. Uh, the power was also mentioned. Um, and uh, this can also happen during the patching itself, which um, needs to be handled as well. So if you're in the middle of patching the system and then you lose power, and next time you boot, what happens? Uh, and then you have the network connectivity. So that was also mentioned here that uh, if the updater doesn't handle that in a secure way, it could be a vulnerability itself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that, that's around the security of the network. And then, of course, it's also can be very unreliable. unreliable. So in cars, it's typically 3, 3G connections, I believe, still today. Or, and uh, this, if you go into a tunnel, you lose connectivity and then, uh, when you're out of the tunnel, you probably don't want to restart from the beginning. You need to start from where you left off. Um, yeah. so, so there's uh, quite a few extra challenges that need to be handled. Uh, yeah, so diving a bit further, this is typically how uh, the patching is done for an embedded client. Uh, you could have more details here as well, but uh, the flow is typically that you try to detect the update somehow, or it can be initiated by the user also, potentially, or by the uh, when you're in, in for a repair, you could uh, could initiate it through some some physical means that you're nearby, and you would download it into the system, do integrity checks, authent authenticate it. So signatures are typically the way, and this was not done by the GP or the yeah, Jeep Cherokee. So they didn't actually verify the authenticity of the firmware update. So uh, that has its place there as well. Uh, you might want to decrypt and uh, encrypt the update also, depending on what's inside of it, if there are security fixes. Some people prefer to do it. Uh, and extract and, and install it afterwards, and then as a last step, you, like I mentioned, what, mm, what if the update failed for some reason? Maybe you lost power, or you uh, figured out that the system didn't boot afterwards. You need to handle that somehow, um, so you don't have to drive out and, and fix it yourself. 
Um, so just a few words also on the different types of updates. I know this has been covered a bit in other sessions as, as well, uh, but um, uh, so you can do full image updates, uh, and then you have package-based updates or uh, tarballs or um, yeah, com compressed files basically, and then you also have the Docker container updates. So how you do this also has trade-offs with respect to download size and installation time. A rollback is easier on, on the full image updates because uh, you can have dual partitions and, and consistency is, is also a bit easier there. But uh, the, the big thing obviously is that uh, the packages are smaller than the images and, and so on. So there's always these trade-offs. But uh, what I found is that uh, typically people prefer the uh, to have that rollback capability, and they will have uh, rather take the the performance trade off uh, in order to have that. So you avoid these bricks as uh, much as possible. Um, yeah. So what can go wrong? I'm sure you're familiar with that question. Uh, so. These are some things that you can do when you're doing software updates to reduce the risk of it. So integrity checking, that was one part of it, the checksums. Uh, it's pretty easy to implement as well. A rollback um, should be there. So uh, as a, just a catch roll, so you don't really know all the reasons why it might fail or how it might fail, um, but you just know uh, maybe you know the main reasons, but there's always something new that will, will show up, and uh, rollback can be a, sort of a catch-all for, for all these cases uh, to handle at least most of the unknowns as well. Uh, but then you have to think about how, how you do the update uh, type as well in order to design the system to support it. Um, so phase rollout, I think... A uh, more common way th uh, to name that is, is campaign management. So basically what you do here is that, so this is used by all big, or yeah, all big infrastructures um, from a completely different uh, industry. I can give one example, which is Facebook. Uh, so the way they, they develop a lot of new software every day, obviously, and you might not see it. I, I'm not on Facebook uh, personally, but uh, um, you have all these feeds that are going on, and uh, um, they, the way they deploy their software is that they choose one region or one group of people based on some attributes. For example, they can choose everybody in New Zealand are going to, to we're going to send this to deploy this to everybody in New Zealand first, and then they will. Uh, um, monitor the metrics, okay, what does the network look like before and after, um, and uh, then after some time they will move on maybe to Australia and New Zealand and then expand uh, like that. So you can do that uh, geographically or you can do it in any other way maybe um, based on age or uh, other attributes. And this, this is a general thing that you can do no matter uh, what kind of software you're rolling out, basically. I, I think it's campaign management is the correct word there. Okay, provisioning. Got it. So, just to wrap things up, uh, uh, some of the points for securing the software-defined car. Uh, use open source software where there's no differentiation, there's no reason to do anything else. Uh, and especially if it's well-maintained, which I hope OpenSSL is right now, but uh, uh, you should check that as well. Uh, have a way to deploy over-the-air updates, and then also these uh, security principles that we talked about. We saw that in the hack that happened in the Fiat Chrysler that they were uh, 
not followed uh, that well either. But they're often overlooked, but if you do think about it while you design the system, you can still avoid a lot of these problems. So I believe that was it. So yeah, thank you for coming. And uh, are there any, we had some good questions, but if there are any other questions or comments, please feel free. Yeah. And that is, what I think, one of the major problems. Yeah. So you have a distributed rollback, basically. <laughs> so I guess, uh, yeah, that sounds like an interesting problem. Oh, so we use full images, dual root of us today. And uh, uh, yeah, it's basically because uh, it's more robust. And uh, we start out with, um, with making it as safe as possible. And then we will see if we will add other types of, of updates afterwards. But we just figured we will start with this and, and maybe expand from there. We can, you can stop by and, and have a look, a deeper look if you want. It's yeah. upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments, feedback? Or ready for more coffee? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>